Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review, who is also the co-author of Heavy Lifting. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, as usual. And, Jim, it's such a busy day that we're not devoting all three to the debate. Usually we do Mm. that, and we even did it with the Democrats. Uh, That's how the news was that particular day after the debate. But big news in Washington this morning. Uh, To no one's surprise, Paul Ryan, who got the nomination of House Republicans yesterday, was elected Speaker of the House. People were watching to see how many House Freedom Caucus members might still go with Dan Webster. In the end, it wasn't that many. 236 votes for Paul Ryan. Uh, So he did very, very well. No real drama there about him clinching the speakership. Uh, He gave a a short address. For the most part, he talked about things in general terms, but they were things that needed to be addressed. After saying some nice things about departing House Speaker John Boehner, Ryan got right down to business. But let's be frank. The House is broken. We're not solving problems. We're adding to them. And I am not interested in laying blame. We are not settling scores. We are wiping the slate clean. Neither the members nor the people are satisfied with how things are going. We need to make some changes, starting with how the House does business. We need to let every member contribute, not once they've earned their stripes, but now. I come at this job as a two-time committee chair. The committees should retake the lead in drafting all major legislation. And, Jim, that should be happy news for those of us who care about how things get done, as you were talking about yesterday. Then Ryan talked about how the real concern ought to be helping people who are struggling. They're working harder than ever before to get ahead, and yet they're falling further behind. They feel robbed. They feel cheated by their birthright, of their birthright. They're not asking for any favors. They just want a fair chance. And they're losing faith that they will ever get it. Then they look at Washington and all they see is chaos. What a relief to them it would be if we finally got our acts together. What a weight off of their shoulders. How reassuring it would be if we actually fixed the tax code, put patients in charge of their health care, grew our economy, strengthened our military, lifted people out of poverty, and paid down our debt. So, Jim, we'll see how the specifics play out on some of these key issues going forward. But when it comes to a guy who can understand where most people are coming from and articulate a vision, he's off to a good start. It is. Again, if you were frustrated with the lack of passion you sensed in John Boehner, a sense that he was not a compelling speaker, that he couldn't articulate a good conservative message. I hope you are more pleased with Paul Ryan. I think what's most significant to me, Greg, was he had what? Was it 246 total votes? 236. 236. I'm sorry. So 236, about a, you know, a dozen or so not with him in the conference. Do you remember, like, like, was it a week ago, two weeks ago, that the Washington Post said the Republicans were on the verge of no longer being able to function as a national party? Yes. Yeah, Republicans in disarray, the, the, you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's the end of Republican, you know, and here we are. First of all, if for whatever reason, you know, Paul Ryan's not your guy, that's fine. Uh, Daniel Webster ran. Daniel Webster did not get a majority of Republican votes in the caucus vote yesterday. And you got a, you know, a handful of votes today. But you know what? Good for you, Dan Webster. You stood for your principles. You did, gave it your best shot. And now it looks like most Republicans have said, including a whole bunch of people who were with Webster yesterday, say, you know what, I committed to Webster early. He's a fine man. But now that the choice of the caucus is Ryan, it looks like most of the Freedom Caucus lined up behind Ryan. And so I, I'm, I am optimistic about the chances of a more unified Republican Party moving forward. Admittedly, it's not the hardest, highest bar to clear. <laughs> if you felt like the, the era of McConnell-Boehner uh, leadership had, had failed, here comes the Ryan era, and let's see if a change is as good as a rest. Let's see if this can change. I think if nothing else, Ryan is a better messenger for the GOP, and we will see how things shake out from here. Yeah, I think there's people even a while back who were hoping Paul Ryan would do this at some point, even though he clearly never wanted to do it. Uh, but now that he's got the job, uh, he could be very effective on a number of key issues, and hopefully he'll be a galvanizing uh, force for the caucus in a conservative direction. On to the bad martini now, and we head to the Republican presidential debate that took place yesterday at Colorado University in Boulder. CNBC 
hosted the debate, and let's just say they're pretty much the story. If you were watching baseball or just uh, didn't tune into the debate last night, uh, the questions were quite leading. Here's a quick montage put together by Tom Elliott over at National Review Online. You've done very well in this campaign so far by promising to build a wall and make another country pay for it. Right. Send 11 million people out of the country. Cut taxes $10 trillion without increasing the deficit. Right. And make Americans better off because your greatness would replace the stupidity and incompetence of others. That's right. Let's be honest. <laughs> Is this a comic book version of a presidential no, campaign? It's not a comic that book. you give nearly twice as much of a gain in after tax income to the top 1% as to people in the middle of the income scale. Since you're the champion of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, don't you have that backward? No, that's you're wrong. Right I talked to economic advisors who have served presidents of both parties. They said that you have as much chance of cutting taxes that much without increasing the deficit as you would of flying away from that podium by flapping your arms. And then when it came to Ted Cruz, he was asked a question about the recent deal struck between the White House and congressional leaders about the budget going forward. Cruz decided not to focus on that but to go after the moderators for asking such leading liberal questions. The questions that have been asked so far in this debate illustrate why the American people don't trust the media. This is not a cage match. And you look at the questions, Donald Trump, are you a comic book villain? Ben Carson, can you do math? John Kasich, will you insult two people over here? Marco Rubio, why don't you resign? Jeb Bush, why have your numbers fallen? How about talking about the substantive issues people care about? Jim, the whole conservative Twitter sphere was basically in all caps and exclamation points after that last night and uh, well-deserved because CNBC really did a horrible job. I had said it was probably the best moment of Ted Cruz's campaign so far. And you know what's kind of fascinating is that to the extent Ted Cruz has a weakness when he's in a debate like this, he was on the debate team in, in, in the Ivy Leagues, he's a good debater. But he comes across sometimes as a little too rehearsed. You can kind of see his mind going through the talking points as he does it, a little too slick maybe. And yesterday, because he was responding to something that happened just moments earlier, you know that was off the cuff, right? There's no way you can prepare because you don't know what the questions are going to be beforehand. He's good on his feet. And it's kind of interesting. He hasn't had a chance to really showcase that until now. So kudos to Ted Cruz. You know, besides the fact that all the questions are liberal and leading and all that stuff, look, if you're a Republican running for president, you have to be able to deal with the liberal media. So our objection is not that. I think they were just basically like stupid questions, all beginning from this um, supposition that these these candidates are weirdos, freaks, uh, abnormal, and, and there's something, you know, terribly wrong with them. For example, if you want to go after Donald Trump, you know, and you want to pin him down on the specifics of his proposals, go right ahead. But if you begin by saying, you know, Donald Trump, are you a, a comic book ve- version of a, of a presidential candidate? If you sneer at Donald Trump, Donald Trump is going to sneer right back at you. And Donald Trump is really good at sneering at people. <laughs> that's, that's really especially – and sneering at somebody from CNBC, he, you know, the audience is going to like that. So even for what – if they were trying to um, – put the, the candidates on the spot and make them have to answer uncomfortable questions, uh, they did a terrible job at that. And I think you know, this, Cruz did it very well that each one of – first of all, remember, the op- we didn't even get it to it. The opening question, Greg, remember, was what is your biggest weakness? <laughs> right. And shockingly, they didn't answer it, you know, or each one of them was like, you know, I'm too impatient to build a greater America. I think I think Rubio, who I think otherwise had a fantastic night, he said, I think I'm too optimistic. I believe that America's better days are I'm like, that's not a weakness. <laughs> and it was kind of I think it was it was a Ted Cruz or somebody said, that's a really good question. And I'm going to ignore it. And I'm going to give my opening statement, basically. Yes. Um, and again, the whole thing just seemed like it was designed, you know, designed to create uh, video images for the DNC and use DNC talking points as the starting point. Uh, on the Rubio question, apparently Harwood got it totally wrong. Yes. Uh, it, you know, Becky Quick just uh, at one point she asked t- Donald Trump where she read something. <laughs> How the heck does he know? I actually thought Trump had a pretty good night. And at one point he says, look, I, you guys write this stuff. I don't know. Um, it, it was comically bad at certain points. I actually think most of the candidates did pretty darn well, with maybe one exception. And maybe it's a good segue to our third martini, Greg. <laughs> it is indeed. I'll just say one last thing about the CNBC folks. In addition to really liberal leading questions, 
they wouldn't shut their mouth after they finished asking it. They kept yes. interjecting and trying to interrupt and and uh, basically debate or thinking they were conducting an interview instead of moderating a debate. It's a big difference, and they really look terrible doing it. Yeah, I've been complaining about the the format of these for a while. I, I think it doesn't make any sense to me to have eleven people on the. I guess we're down to ten people on the big stage. It makes no sense in that four candidate undercard debate to have the ninety second time limit and thirty second time limit for rebuttals. There's four guys. <laughs> let, let, let them talk. And the whole thing was like, "Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Speak. You know, thank you, Senator. You know." And they, they kept cutting them off. And like, give the guys the extra 15 seconds to finish their thought. It's irritating. You could tell everybody was trying to squeeze in their words, finish their points. There was a lot of cross talking, which you just couldn't hear what somebody was saying. It was just a bad job, top to bottom, uh, by by CNBC. And they are they deserve every last bit of criticism they're getting this morning. Well, there was one question that uh, got Jim Hackles up, and it wasn't because of the question. It was because of the answer, as he alluded to a moment ago. This is our crazy martini. Carl uh, Quintanilla was one of the uh, questioners from CNBC, and he asked Ben Carson about his affiliation with a couple different organizations. One was about Costco and its policy towards gay couples. And after that, he asked about a company called Manatech. Is a company called Manatech, a maker of nutritional supplements with which you had a 10-year relationship. They offered claims that they could cure autism, cancer. They paid $7 million to settle a deceptive marketing lawsuit in Texas. And yet your involvement continued. Why? Well, that's easy to answer. I didn't have an involvement with them. That is total propaganda. And this is what happens in our society, total propaganda. I did a couple of speeches for them. I did speeches for other people. They were paid speeches. It is absolutely absurd to say that I had any kind of a relationship with them. Do I take the product? Yes. I I think it's a good product. Uh, To be fair, you were on the homepage of their website with the logo over your shoulder. If somebody put me on their homepage, they did it without my permission. Does that not speak to your vetting process or judgment in any way? No, it speaks to the fact that I don't know that it's going on. <laughs> See, they know. Now, longtime listeners will know that Jim did a story on this a number of months ago, and as soon as Carson denied any real involvement with Man Attack, I knew you'd be jumping off the couch. I, I basically reacted like uh, George Brett when they accused him of... Uh, <laughs> Pine tarring on his bat. <laughs> so here's the thing. This is a perfectly you know, valid topic that I don't think was asked very well. Um, because I, you know, Carson has a legitimate point. Like he can't control somebody else putting up their image on the website. What I would have, you know, the, the explanation that makes the most sense here is that, yeah, Ben Carson did the speeches and also appeared in company videos um, and didn't really do his due diligence, should have looked into the company. When I spoke to Armstrong Williams about this way back in like, God, you know, December or January, it was very clear Armstrong Williams had no idea about this lawsuit from the Texas then Attorney General uh, Greg Abbott. He should have done more of his homework. He probably should have thought more carefully about whether he wanted uh, Ben Carson, you know, world's greatest neurosurgeon, associated with a company that was in some serious legal trouble for, for false advertising. Now, you can argue about whether this is really an important enough issue to reject Ben Carson as a presidential candidate. I would just say, Greg, if Ben Carson had bothered to talk to me for the story, I might feel a little differently about it. You know, sending out Armstrong Williams to to take the flack did not uh, endear him to me. But I still overall like Ben Carson. Last night's answer, I think, is a very big deal because he just lied through his teeth saying there's no relationship. He was in company videos talking about how they're doing God's work. The entire claim is to say, oh, well, we didn't technically endorse it. We didn't use the words I endorse. And, you know, well, we didn't get paid by the company. We got paid by a speaker's bureau that hired, you know, the company paid. It is entirely this kind of semantical argument, and it's extremely disappointing that a guy who's known for plain speaking and directness will come out and, and, and hide behind, you know, things like this. It is a, uh, um, and and I, I keep hearing people say, oh, this doesn't really matter. Well, look, if, if the Republican frontrunner is lying his tush off about something like this, yeah, heck yeah, it does matter. Rah! <laughs> Jim is fired up. There are other good moments yesterday where they don't have time to. The Rubio-Jeb exchange was certainly telling. Uh, Mike Huckabee had a good analogy to the government with the blimp. When it comes to the blimp, though, Jim, uh, of course, it was dragging this huge tether along that unfortunately knocked out power to thousands. But it was doing some heavy lifting. So I'm wondering how you're going to tie that into your promotion. (laughs) Cam, I got this great deal. There's this discount on advertising on a blimp. (laughs) The only bad news is we can't control where it goes. (laughs) Greg, I assume you'd heard that uh, the reason that the blimp got loose, it was this you know, overinflated, very large, expensive object controlled by the government uh, and apparently got knocked loose by a heavy-handed metaphor. <laughs> 
Jim, I'm amazed that you're still awake after all the work that you've done this week, your real job plus the book. And uh, thanks so much, as always, for your time. Well, it just means tomorrow's show is going to be really terrible, Greg. So stay tuned, everybody. (laughs) Jim Carrey of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.